Morning. My name is Rivo, and he doesn't know. And thank you, Pastor, for allowing me to take this pulpit and share the Word of God. Appreciate it. Um, as soon as Pastor asked me to do a message here, Lord laid on my heart just to um, straight away laid on my heart to do a message about Lot and uh, the character of Lot and who he is, and um, that's what we attempt to do today. Uh, Lot is a very controversial character in the Bible. If any of you know a little bit about him, he's called a righteous man and a just man, but yet if you look at his life, he lived a very, very wretched life. So we look at this today and just try and observe his life and trying to learn from it and trying to see from his life just really how this backsliding started from his life and what it ended up with. So it is kind of a, an interesting concept, and I don't understand it, that a man who's inside born again, he's completely new, can live such a wretched life. It, it is a kind of a paradox or, or even kind of illogical thing for us to think about. But it, it happened with Lot, and I can see that still it happens today. Still happens today. So this, this is a person who's inside, he's born again, but he, he looks like a world, he talks like a world, he dresses as a world. You know, there's, everything about him is just as a world. But yet God calls him righteous. It's a strange paradox. So we're really going to study the Bible tonight. So I hope you have a Bible here today. We're very blessed to have a Bible. You know, there's been ages when there's been no Bible. And we're very blessed to have one. So if you have your Bible here today, please open your Bible with me. Even the children, please. Yes, you too, mate. And open up in Genesis 11. Where we really see who Lot is. And we start his journey. You know, just maybe first look at who he is. And who was Abraham and how the journey started together and how the separation happened and then, then so on. So Genesis 11, we start reading from Genesis 20, 11, 27 to 32. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah beget Abram, Nahor and Haran and Haran beget Lot. And Haran did, died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram, Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishak. But Sarah was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter in law, his son Abraham's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now we find in this passage that Lot was a man. He was a Hebrew man. And his father was Haran. Haran had two brothers. One of them was Nahor, and the other one was Abram. Their father is Terah. Lot's father dies in the land of Ur. We don't know if he, if he died when they left, or after they left. Perhaps he stayed back with his brother after Terah took um, Abraham and, and, and Sarah and, and Lot and left. We don't really know that. Okay, But Abraham just journeys out from the land, He's been called to go to Canaan. And now we see that they stop in Haran again. They stop in Haran for some reason and they dwell there. And the Bible talks about the terror dies there. So before they even start the journey, we don't know exactly when, but we understand that perhaps the father and the, and the, and the grandfather of this boy, Lot, perhaps died. And so he was kind of fatherless. We don't know exactly the timing of it, but, you know, there was, that's a possibility that they died just there. But what we want to look at here today is, you know, when the journey begins with Abraham and Lot, which starts from Genesis uh, chapter 12, from 1 to 3. 
So this is the journey and where the God gives the promise to Abraham and also a, a, a separation from his family. He says, Now the Lord hath said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is where God directly speaks to Abraham and gives him a promise. A promise not just for him, but also for the nation of Israel. But also he gives him a strict command. He says, get thee out. Separate thyself. Separate thyself from the place you're residing right now, also from your blood relatives, and also from thy father's house. Go. Leave everything behind. Just take your wife and go. Okay? So now we get to the point, and Abraham has been spoken to, but then he says he takes a lot with him. He took the lot with him. We don't know why he did that. We don't know if perhaps, you know, it says here in verse 4 that uh, as so Abraham departed as the Lord has spoken to him and Lot went with him, that kind of if the Lot perhaps just, you know, kind of tagged along or it says here that Abraham took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother, so kind of that Abraham took him with him. But either of the case, I think it's a mistake of Abraham here not obeying God and he takes... He takes him with him. It's really on the harness on Abraham here. So, next thing we see, Abraham leaves the country. He, he's, he's going to Canaan. He gets there and he is, is building the altar. And the first time in the Bible, it talks about that he is worshipping God. This, he worshipping God in Canaan and he's building him an altar and he's, you know, he's doing right in the eyes of God. And that's excellent. But yet he made a mistake. He took Lot with him. He took him with him. Now, we're really focusing on Abraham here, but what I want to paint the picture here is that Abraham was really influencing Lot here. And the next, next step when we see is that Abraham is, is lacking of faith and is really a, a backsliding of Abraham's life. Abraham at this point. Is that there's going to be a backsliding in his life. We all know the story how the famine comes to the land and, and he kind of don't see how God can provide now. And he makes a choice that he's going to go to Egypt, right? But who goes with him? Sarah and Lot. Lot's watching. Lot's watching Abraham. Abraham. He's watching him. Now, in this passage here, when you look at probably till um, the end of this chapter from 10 to 20, Genesis 12, 10 to 20, we, we, we don't really see that Abram Abraham is trusting God at all. There's no point in time when Abram says, oh, Lord, help me, or goes to God for help. Now, when we see his, his backsliding in, you know, first, like we said, in, you know, not trusting in provisions, we see him... You know, um, you know, being fearful of his wife and, you know, just really insecure about it. And so he, he goes and dwells in this land, which we think it's kind of the, we know it's a kind of picture of the world. Till even to the point when, because of his lies, what he said to, e to the Egyptian Pharaoh, he's now been blessed. Bible talks about here in verse 16, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. So he, he's, he's, he's kind of going on with everything what's going on in, in Egypt. He's happy to be there. And just really by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, God rebukes him through Pharaoh. But if we rewind a little bit back here, I believe in this point of time when Abram is backsliding, you know, this is kind of look, looking at the Christian and trying to make an application here that, you know, when, when, when a Christian is backslidden, you know, he has no power to present God. You know, you're kind of weak in your testimony because you have doubt, because you have fear, 
And you can't go out and then just you know, tell people about the Lord and, and trust God and, and be, really be active for the Lord. And Abraham was really disabled here. I really believe that. And God, by His mercy, by his, truly His miracle, brought along plagues to Egypt. He plagued Egypt. It's a miracle of God. And He did it because of Abraham. He did it because of him. Right? Pharaoh rebukes him. He said, what have you done? Why have you done this to me? And he kicks him out. Actually kicks him out. God, in his mercy, chastens Abraham through the miracle. And we see it here and we think, okay, God chastened him. Pharaoh kicked him out. What happened next? He leaves and on the surface it kind of looks, well, he... He brought, you know, he, he took Sarah and Lot with him again and kind of went out. And, and what else did he have a lot? A lot of money. He had a lot of wealth to take with him. And we kind of say, well, that's, that's quite all right. I did all right, eh? But when you really look at who he else took with him, if we read in Genesis 16, in verse 1, it says, Sarah had a handmaid... Her name was Hagar, and where was she from? She was from Egypt. Perhaps that was a time when he took her with him. And a great other mistake took place later on. There's always a consequence of sin. Eternally, yes, it's under the blood. But this life, it, every time, sin causes sorrow, it causes grief... It causes shame, great shame. Okay, let's get back to Lot though. And, and let's put the picture in the light of Lot here. Lot is looking at Abraham. Abraham is in, influencing Lot here in this passage. They went out of it together. Now think about it. If you look at in Genesis 13.10, you know when now Lot is making decision where he's going to go? Let's turn there, 13.10. Remember the decision you need to make, you know, between the two planes? And he says here in verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that he was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord and what it says now, like the land of Egypt. Now, who took Lot to Egypt? Abraham. Abraham took him there. Abraham took him there. You know, he, he introduced Lot to worldliness. That was his introduction. And think about it, guys. Think about us. We influence people. Don't think that when you're a Christian and you're backsliding, don't you think other people are watching? Don't you think your neighbours are watching? Your family is watching like Lot was watching? They are watching, I, I promise you. Don't you think other Christians, even weaker, like brothers and sisters in your church, don't you think they're watching? They are watching, I promise you. Are you influencing your family with a wilderness? Are you? That's a challenge, guys. That's a challenge to me. That's a challenge to my walk with God. Because God wants us to live holy and pure, separated from this world. That's what he wants us to do. People are watching. Are you familiarizing your family to the world? We see later on exactly what the world is. So let's look at Genesis 13, 4 now. It's a blessing to see that Abraham goes straight back to the altar as he, as he gets out from Egypt, if you kind of rewind back a little bit, and he made in, that he made in Canaan and worshipped God again. God is always gracious and brings us back to himself so we really see that he kind of made a bit of a detour. That's what Abraham really did. And let's see how he kind of get, get, gets back to the, with the Lord. But I kind of thought, I thought of this, I thought, you know what? This, this is like 
This, he, he kind of, he, he went away, he went away, he went away, and then he came back, right? He kind of came back to where he started. You know, he drifted. You know, it's like, it's, I thought of it, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a boat. And, you know, it sets the anchor down, straight down, where he wants to be, and then the winds come, and the currents come. And, you know, the boat goes tossing and turning and, and goes everywhere. And, and perhaps the anchor's there now. And it's kind of like, you know, the, 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 the big thing that holds it the, uh, together, the chain, is kind of like this, right? But once you pull that anchor back up, it straightens itself up again. You know, guys, this ought to be our Christian life. You know, when the world, you know, drifts us there and back and forward, settle it down. Make your conviction straight. Bring, bring it back to God. Do it. This, this is what God wants to do. It's, you know, like I've heard this saying and it's really stuck to me. It says, you know, the Christian life is like a series of new beginnings. It's just a series. Begin again every day. Repent again, start again. You know, maybe it takes a month, takes three weeks. You know, start again. Start again. Rely that anchor again. Rely it. So let's get back to Lot here. And Abraham are back in Canaan. So this is in uh, chapter 13, 5 to 6. So Lot and Abraham back in Canaan, going about the business, growing and minding the sheep. And you know what God... In verse 6 and 7, he brings an increase to separate the two guys. Now there is so much sheep that they don't have enough food. And they have to separate. God brings his will to pass. He wants Lot and Abraham to be separated. He wants it. So he does it by bringing increase in the land. So he does that, and you know, it's really beautiful to see in verse 8 and 9 how Abraham is now really betraying a great character here, would live peaceably with all men and, and gives in and trusts God, will look after him regardless of the external circumstances. He gives in. He learned his lesson with the famine and going back to Egypt. He did not make the same mistake again. He could have kicked the stink out there, you know, because he was kind of the, you know, he was the leader, right? Abram was the leader. He, he, he could have said, Lot, mate, man, I'll, I'll, I'll take the greens. You'll take the desert. Don't worry about it. That's mine. He had, you know, he, he had a right to do that. But he didn't. He trusted God. He trusted God. Take the desert. This is my land. No, Abraham trusted God. Lot, though... He was not that wise, not that wise at all. He chose the opposite. He looks around, he looks around, what's best for me? What's best for me? How can my flocks increase? What's best for me? Oh, the well water brooks. Oh. The garden. Oh, this is good. Whew. More dough. More sheep. That'd be great. Young guys, more money. Where's more money? I'll go. More bling bling. Yeah? Think about it. Trusting, he really trusting that this world will fulfill the desires of your life. That is the start, this was the start of Lot's backsliding. That was, that's the start, guys. This, this, this is the bit you need to be like zone in on that one. If you have your eyes upon the world, this, this is where it starts. I wrote down here in James 1, 14, it says, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. He's drawn away out of his own lust. 
I will have bigger herds. I will have more sheep, more goods for me, man. Lot was tempted and Lot was drawn. What is tempting you guys? What's drawing you guys? What's drawing you? What's tempting you? What's your temptation in your life that's drawing you right now? What is it? What, what are you setting your eyes upon and going, I want that? <coughs> what is that? What is it? Is it your career? Is it the system? What is it? Is it the money? Is it your hobby? What is it? What is drawing you? What, and where is it taking it? Where is it taking you? This decision is reminding me, I don't know if you, if you read the book called Pilgrim's Progress. Good. This reminds me of the worldly wise man. The worldly wise man. You know, he had this beautiful, beautiful, glittering path to the pilgrim to go towards that ended up in a legality hill. This, this, is, where, this is where Lot was at. Oh, wow. Let's go on this one that my eyes are seeing. Beautiful. Where is it leading? We will find out where Lot went to very shortly. First step was trusting in himself, drawn by the worldly pleasures. Now, very quickly we see Genesis 13, and 13 12 and 13, second step of Lot's backsliding. We see the next step that he took. 12 and 13. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled... Now he's dwelling in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Wow, this is happening really quickly, guys. Really, really fast. Now, we would say this. This is a very bad place. This is, I mean, the Bible says this is like the men were sinners exceedingly. Like very much. Like we would go, this is the valley. Kids don't go there. This is a wicked place. You know, Friday night, there's, there's people there doing drugs. Don't go there. Yes, I would do a face like that too. Yeah, like that. Don't go there. People commit whoredoms in there. They sell their bodies. Pastor mentioned that this, this morning. They sell their bodies. They not to sell them, they ruin their bodies. That's what they do there. Don't think that this world, what they do is don't have consequences. It does. It does. Praise God when, you, when you've grown up in the church and you ha haven't had this influence, but some of you have, I have. It has consequences. And he's there now. He's there. He's there. Sodom was wicked and sinful exceedingly. And Lot was there. Lot was there. He set his tent. It's kind of like me saying going in the, you know, in the valley and just buying an apartment there. Just purely for the reason so I can go and hang out with these guys. Man, his heart was there. His heart was there. Genesis 14.12, we see in the next chapter... Now Lot is actually dwelling in Sodom. Before he set his pitch, but he's dwelling there now. Not just stopping by, not just you know, pitching the tent. Now he's living there with a whole mob. Ezekiel says, the book of Ezekiel, don't turn there, it's 1649, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of the sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters, Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Firstly, these guys had a really good opinion about themselves. They're really, really, yep, I'm the best here. This is what they thought about themselves. They had loads of food. They had loads of free time. Okay? And they didn't give a hoot about helping the poor. This is what got them to this point where they were. Later on, we see how wicked they really was, were. I would call them arrogant sluggers. Sodom was a place of arrogant sluggers. 
And Lot was living with them. He was living with these guys. He was happy to be there. His, Lot was a great compromiser. He was a great, great compromiser. Now, let's bring Abraham to this story a little bit. We see two times between chapter 13 and 19 how Abraham is helping and still cares for Lot. You know, this is a great picture of a Christian going after a man who's gone away. Is, you know, like just showing the character of Abraham now. Just going after and rescuing Lot out of, you know, his, uh, when he was taken captive. You know, he, he brought him back, you know, out of captivity. Um, it spoke, anyway, I'll skip that. I'm just running out of time. But also, it was the second time was that how he, he prayed for Sodom. That really ministered to my heart. Because I thought, you know what? You know, Abraham knew these guys, how wicked they were. But, you know, you see how he prays for them. You know, Abraham was a soul winner. He prayed for souls. You know, in chapter, in, um, I believe it's in Genesis 18, Abraham is pleading for Sodom. You know the story when he goes from, from, uh, from you know, I think it was from 50 to 40 and, you know, all the way down to 10, right? And, you know, he's, 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 he's pleading. He's pleading with the angels. Spare the whole city, Lord, please. Don't destroy the righteous with the wicked. Abraham pleaded for them. What a heart of that man. He prayed for souls. He was a soul winner. He was a prayer warrior. He wanted people to come to righteousness. He loved people. Even exceeding wicked and sinful people. He loved them. He loved them. He pleaded for them. You know, he, you know, think about it. He pleaded for the people who were living with Lot and a place where Lot lived. He pleaded for it. How are you going with that? There's a wicked place, brother, you're going. There's going to be some places where it's going to be pretty bad. Plead for them. Have a heart for plead for people. Pray for their salvation. Have a heart to pray. Be a prayer warrior. You know, prayer is a great weapon. Sure is. Genesis 19 is really where we see how worse things get for, um, for Lot. I mean, it's just, his backsliding is, you know, going here beyond measure. It's really, we see now how he's a great man there. He's not just a, an average man. He's a great man in Sodom. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to be a great man in, in amongst the wicked people. I want to be a great man in, in amongst of God's people. So he, he's, you know, he's you know, getting himself up there. Um, so we see the progression how you know, he pitched his tents to Sodom for worldly advantages, then became a great man in Sodom, accepting the morals of Sodom. He was a great compromiser. Genesis 19, 1 and 2, we see that he still bows down to the angels um, as they come to him. You know, he knew how wicked the, the state of this town was and he pleads for them to come in to his house. And, um, but it fascinated me that he thought that they would just come and go. He never realized that this is the judgment. He never, it never kind of came to his mind that, oh, we might be judged here. He never thought of that. But, you know, this is why they came there. This is why they came. He wanted to just host them. So, anyway, he compels them to come in. They come in. They have a meal, which was kind of, I thought, you know, also when he had the, the, um, the unleavened bread, Perhaps we can give Lot a bit of a benefit of the doubt, thinking he's trying to keep his house still in order, because you know, kind of having no leaven in the house shows that you know there's no sin in the house. But from verse four to eleven, it's really this horrible scene. This, it's disgusting. We we see how worse sin gets. How the men of Sodom want to come and sleep. With these angels. That's disgusting. That's horrible. You know, these, and, and what makes it worse 
is that these guys, these guys came from every part of Sodom. And they were young, so they were old, and they were young. That's sad. That's sad, guys. I've seen some young kids who go into wickedness. Young people. It breaks my heart. It just breaks my heart, guys. And you know, and when, you know, the lot now comes out when these guys are at the door, you know, they bang him. Lord, let me in! We want to get those angels! Lot kind of just sneaks out and, you know, comes out there. Oh, brothers, don't do this wicked thing. Brothers? Really? Really? Brothers? <sighs> That's horrible. So then Lot went so far, he started calling wicked homosexuals who wanted to rape angels his brothers. Wow. You know, I kind of thought of, you know, Abram. He called when he went and rescued Abram. Sorry, when Abram went and rescued Lot out of his um, captivity, he called Lot his brother. He called Lot his brother. You know, he loved him. He called his brother. You know, we call ourselves brothers and sisters here. This is a family. This is a family here. We're not the family with the world. So then he kind of goes to another level and he, he wants to offer his, his daughters. Wow. I'm a dad. I would never ever do that. Offer my two daughters to be raped. Is, is, that, is that a dad? Would you call this man a Christian? I don't know. But God calls him righteous, so he is. He was very backslidden, very, very backslidden. He was willing to give up his children to the world, knowing what these guys would do. They, <laughs> these guys were so enraged that even when Lot was pleading with them, he, they wanted to come through the door. Through Lot. Like, what rage is this? What is that? Now, the angels pull him in, right? The angels pull him back in and blind these horrible guys. And what happens then? In their blindness, in their bl they're still trying to find the door. Are you serious? This, this, is, this is the wicked heart of a man. Unrepented. You know, I would, you know, if something happened, to me, I would just be on my knees. Mercy, Lord. I repent. What a miracle. Just all, all these guys blinded. Boom. Straight away. They still, where's the door? Crazy. Okay. Angels tell Lot to get anyone else who is righteous. He thinks his son-in-laws are, but they just mock him. That's in verse 12 to 14. Verse 15 to 16, we see that Lot is being urged, you need to move and get out of this mess. You have put yourself in and come with us. In verse 16, it says he lingered. He was slow about it. He was looking what to bring with him, what I'm leaving behind. He's doubting here again and understand. He just doesn't understand what's about to happen. Now, this is, you know, God's sending judgment now. He doesn't understand judgment is coming. He's still thinking what he needs to bring along. I mean, like, if the house is on fire, you run, right? He's not running. He's thinking still in his worldly sense. Still thinking. Pastor, I'm going five minutes over. I hope it's okay. I'm really wrapping up here. Um, he was entangled with the world. Yes. We're living in a world, but we're not called to be living in the world, but we're called out of the world. Out of drinking, smoking, gambling, drugs, worldly pleasures, just over shopping, over eating, video games. So entangled that we don't see the judgment coming anymore. Don't see clearly anymore. Entangled. Wrapped up. We just see the stuff 
that it doesn't matter. We don't have the eyes to eternity. We don't see it. It's clouded. Big cloud here. What is truly important to you? What are you setting your affections on? What is it? Are you really setting your affections on high? Okay, Lord and his family being grabbed by the angels, really grabbed, dragged out of the mess, outside of Sodom. Lord then comes, he pleads and says, oh, please, I really want to go to this city, this small, give me this small city. Angels grant him, so he goes to this small city. So only three, and his wife, we know the pillar of salt. Imagine being a person who's judge, just a picture of judgment all your life. Like all, all eternity, going to be a picture of judgment. So, and what it really leads up to is how now his daughters are committing this immoral act with his dad at the, at the very end. Horrible. Horrible. But the, the, the cost was, his, his true cost here, all his journey... What I really want to make a point quickly before I finish was his children. The backsliding, all this backsliding here was to cost of his children. He lost his children. He lost them. He lost them to immorality. And that's the saddest bit for me from this. This is the biggest learning for me from this. And I'm not saying no one can save here, no one. No one. Only God saves. I'm not saying a man can save. I'm not saying that at all. But a Christian, you should at least provide your children an environment where there's a bigger chance that they get saved. And live a holy life. Don't get entangled with the world. Don't make excuses. Live for God. It's not hard. I reckon it's not hard. If you're setting your affections on high... You, you finished. You finished. This is some of the learnings from the life of Lot. And I finished with this. If you, if you know that God spoke to you tonight, deal with, deal with him. Put these things, the worldly things away, and, and deal with it. I, I went to conference last a week, a week ago. God spoke to me. I wrote it down. I did them. Have, have, have some, if God speaks to you, do it. Don't hesitate. Do the things what God wants you to do. So if we can please open our hymn books. And Azrael, do you want to come and lead 517? I'll leave a book up, up here for you.